Welcome. Thank you for being here. If you wouldn't mind giving us a like and consider going ahead and subscribing as well, that would be fantastic. And if you really want to go the extra mile, go down to the description below and click the Patreon link. Lots of cool stuff going on there. As always, I love you and enjoy the show, guys. Chrysalis, a story by user Beaverfur, Chapter 6 Their empty eyes stared at me. Four eyes per body, narrow eyes. Two in front, two to the sides. My assault soldiers advanced along desolated landscapes, passing by the ruined skeletons of trees and collapsed buildings alike, their footsteps making crunchy noises as they stepped on terrain made uneven by the piles of rubble debris, and concrete scattered all over the ground. I had squadrons marching through every one of the planet's many small towns, searching, scanning, sending their data to my main body in orbit. They were escorted from the air by a fleet of drones, flying through the thick gray clouds of radioactive dust that covered the entire world's atmosphere. The Zunvirian bodies were not in underground refuges. In fact, I hadn't found any of those so far. No, they were in the open, scattered, having been flung around by the hurricane-level winds created when I had simultaneously detonated my 3,071 thermonuclear warheads all over the planet. In parts of the main city, the destruction had been so severe that it was hard to distinguish what had once been a building or a wide avenue. I had to refer to the maps I had made previously from orbit to figure it out and direct my army towards the most useful locations. All things considered, though, the damage I had dealt to this planet was still lower than the one the Zunvirians had unleashed against Earth. Albeit irradiated, this planet still had oceans. For now. Or maybe it was a matter of time. If I had started a nuclear winter, maybe in a few years from now temperatures would come crashing down, causing the ocean water to freeze and recede. It was an interesting thought. One worth verifying. So I separated a few drones and set them to stay as permanent orbiting satellites, monitoring this world's future evolution. A monument. I had once wanted to build a monument to humanity. It was important. I felt a deeply rooted urge to fight, to rebel against the idea of time ticking by. Of the last memories of our species being left behind as the galaxy spun on, of having been nothing, amounted to nothing but some irrelevant blip on someone else's history books, of being forgotten. This, this destruction, this ruin, it was retribution. Yes, it was vengeance, but it was so much more. It was also remembrance. It was our cry of pain, defiance, and fury. A cry so high and strong that cities crumbled and worlds died under it. A shout that would linger in the air for centuries, even longer. A shout that they couldn't help but listen to. That nobody could ever pretend not to have heard. Yes, they would fear me for this. They would hate me. Maybe even manage to kill me for it. But they wouldn't ever forget it. This, right here, it was a monument. Here and there, some survivors would try to fight my robotic soldiers. Maybe a lone Zenvirian making a suicidal assault. Maybe a group of them carrying out a better planned attack from the distance. They would shoot at the machines using energy handguns or throw homemade explosives at them. And they would manage to disable or destroy a few. But invariably they would lose... They would be overwhelmed by the assault of the nearby robots, surprised that even an apparently downed soldier could still shoot back at them. Or they would be flanked by a second squad, 
one they couldn't have seen through the dusty fog that covered everything and limited visibility to a few yards, but whose approach I had no problem coordinating. On some rare occasions, one of my drones equipped with energy weapons would be flying nearby, and I would have it take care of the offenders. They would go down as if struck by an angry god, a bolt of lightning coming out of the cloudy skies among a thunderous noise. I preferred it that way. It felt more efficient, more optimal. I wasn't exactly sure how to feel about all this... this destruction. I had almost expected to be contented after I had brought some level of payback to the Zenvirians. Not happy, exactly, but satisfied. Except I didn't feel like that. Not disappointed either, nor regretful. Just that detachment, that emotional indifference as I systematically erased the remaining menaces as if I was crossing off the items in my task list. Just something that had to be done. Me being the appropriate, the only, person available for the job. It was that stillness that annoyed me, that frustrated me to no end. Had I felt gleeful or regretful, it would have meant I was still human at some important level. But this, this lack of emotion, I didn't know how to take it. Was it a normal, expected human response? Or was it a sign of my descent, of my becoming something else? All in all, my casualties were low, even when taking into account those robots that had fallen prey to the dangerous environment, with its shifting piles of rubble, sudden gas explosions, and hidden pit holes. When they weren't fighting, my soldiers shuffled through the remains looking for useful materials, artifacts, and working technology. This was a rare opportunity for me. Over the last weeks I had learned much about the species I was fighting by examining the ships and facilities I had conquered. I had used that knowledge to come up with counters to their attacks and to develop new, more resistant armor, better propulsion and weapons. But in a sense my knowledge had still been limited. All I ever had access to was their military ships and resource extraction outposts. A very narrow slice of society. Right here, now, I was learning about the Zinvirians as a community not only going through their barracks and ships, but also through their homes, markets, farms, factories, administrative buildings. This painted a much richer picture of the enemy I was fighting, and my processing units raced to incorporate each piece of new information, to give it sense, contextualize it, and categorize it, and look for ways in which it could be put to use. I discovered that their society was internally segregated, different buildings and homes sporting banners and identifying symbols of varying color. I wasn't sure what that division represented, but maybe I would be able to exploit it in the future. The spaceport and its large cargo starships told a story of logistics, of interstellar supply runs and resource distribution, a story that already had me shuffling objectives in my mind, reprioritizing possible targets to achieve the best strategy the deepest impact in the Zunvir Republic's trade and military supply chains. It was near the spaceport where I found it, a relatively small spaceship, lodged between two buildings as if it had fallen down from the sky. Its entire rear part was missing, the internal mechanisms, pipes and corridors all exposed to the dusty wind. But that wasn't what piqued my curiosity. No, what piqued my curiosity was that it didn't look Zunvirian. As a mass producer myself, I had begun to show some appreciation toward the Zunvirians' manufacturing techniques. Their spaceships appeared to be constructed by joining together a series of repeating smaller prefabricated modules, many of which were the same across all their different types of spacecrafts that made up their fleet. It was clever. Bulk production of those modules would make costs much cheaper, and it probably allowed for easier orbital assembly of new ships. It was also the reason Zunvirian space vehicles looked like an amalgamation of straight edges and odd angles, or the reason they had been so easy for my soldiers to board. Many modules featuring more openings and vents than strictly necessary in a warship, but that I guessed would come in useful in other types of ship configurations. But the downed craft in front of my soldiers, it didn't look anything like that. This one had been purposely built as a whole. Its aerodynamic shape had been designed to look good, to be elegant and stylized, rather than easy to build. With the help of a drone, I had three of my soldiers climb into the vehicle through its gaping hole. They advanced along the dark corridors, 
using the infrared cameras to see in the darkness. The ship had rolled over, so they were walking on what I assumed was the corridor's ceiling. I maneuvered them slowly and with caution, making sure they wouldn't step on any ventilation grills or exposed pipes and wires. The corridor's walls, I noticed, also lacked the perennial hieroglyphic motifs that I had learnt to associate with Zunvirian decoration. No, these ones were surprisingly minimalistic, with nothing but some very simple line designs etched here and there. It reaffirmed my first impression that this ship wasn't local. I was already cataloging the most interesting pieces of technology to recover from the fallen ship. Sadly, the thrusters, warp drive, and shield projector were all missing. I assumed I would find them wherever the rear end of the vehicle had ended up, if it even existed anymore. But there were still many other devices I wanted to look into, such as the intricate quantum relay communicator, which appeared to be of a more advanced design than the ones I was currently using. I had two of the soldiers start to disassemble it, while the other kept exploring the craft, moving towards the front. That was when I found the two creatures, huddled in what I assumed was the ship's cockpit. One reminded me of a short-snouted fox, covered in brown fur with large, pointy ears. Although without any tail that I could see, it was sitting in the corner furthest away from my soldiers. Hunched over with pain, it looked like it was gravely hurt, its clothes covered in blood, yet it was conscious. The other I immediately classified as a male, a humanoid of smooth silvery skin and graceful lines. He stood right between my soldier and the other hurt alien, aiming an energy handgun at the robot's head. He didn't look like he had ever been in a firefight, though, his aim wavering and his body twitchy. But that could also be a result of his injuries, his face sported a red gash, and his left arm hung useless, covered in blood. I had my soldier stop, and considered my options while the silver creature pronounced words in a language I didn't understand. I could order the robot to attack, of course. The alien would shoot at its head, but that wouldn't incapacitate the machine, only destroy its cameras. The radio transmitter and control unit were both in the chest area, so even when blind, I could still get it to charge at the creature and use its arms to tear them apart. This was something many Zinvirian troops had learnt the hard way. I had the other two robots in the ship stop their salvaging and move towards the cockpit. I could just have them enter guns blazing. The alien might be able to down one of the soldiers if he was fast, but that would be it. Or maybe I could use a drone. Order one of the flying machines to shoot or crash into the downed ship. It would destroy the whole cockpit section, erase the problem. A bit too excessive, perhaps, and it risked damaging the components I wanted to retrieve. But there was something more, I noted. I didn't want to kill them. Oh, I wanted them to be gone. I wanted them to have died in the crash, maybe. It was the idea of shooting them that irked me. Deep down, I had always known that going down this path that engaging in this revenge risked turning me into something else, that if the stars were the place where monsters lived, it would be so easy to become one of them, now that I myself was living in that same endless void. And looking at the ruined planet, perhaps I had already crossed that line. But there had been a reason for that. I hadn't started this war. The Zunvirians had. I was merely taking it to their turf, bringing them the same level of destruction, the same level of pain they had previously unleashed upon us, on humanity. It felt righteous, like I was working towards some sort of balance, some sort of state of equilibrium, the same way the laws of physics did, action and reaction. This, though, shooting, no, executing these aliens I knew nothing about would feel awfully close to starting a new conflict. A new war. I would be the aggressor here, even if I suspected that they were collaborating with the Zunvirians, giving them their support and technology. Should I treat them as the enemies they probably were? Or give peace a chance? I could capture them instead. Wasn't that what many armies had done to suspected spies in the past? I would need to build a suitable habitat for them, of course. Maybe a custom transport ship to house the creatures. But that would be easy. I would then be able to interrogate them, use their knowledge in my favor. 
but again that felt awfully close to an act of aggression. A lesser one, true, but still unwarranted if they happened to be innocent and just be in the wrong place at the wrong time. Besides, something about taking prisoners felt wrong. I didn't really need them. I could retrieve any information I wanted about their technology from the devices I had found in the ship itself. In fact, I guessed interrogating them on engineering specifics would be an arduous, useless task that wouldn't give me any new information that I couldn't gather through reverse engineering. And I just didn't care about their alien politics and intrigues. No, capturing them would only be a delaying tactic. It didn't solve the fundamental decision I had to make. Whether to consider them enemies or not. If they were enemies, then I would kill them. If they weren't, then the right action was to let them go. I almost wished the silvery creature would open fire, resolving my inner conflict, declaring openly his secret allegiance. Then I would be justified. Then I would be perfectly fine with my machines butchering them. But, of course, he didn't. He just stood there, spewing words, words, words. Alien words in languages I didn't understand, like some sort of auditory mirroring of the radio messages the Zunvirian ships often bathed me with. Annoying. The thing was I hadn't given that much thought at what would happen after. After the war ended, after the Zunvirians were done with, after my main purpose had been achieved one way or the other. Somehow a part of me suspected that there wouldn't be any after that achieving that objective, getting to that end goal, might end up requiring a complete sacrifice. But what if I was wrong? What if there was a light at the end of the tunnel? If somehow I could come out of this trail, having reached some sort of balance, of inner peace? Then what? Maybe I could try my best at restoring humanity. I hadn't really thought about that. But if that was the case, then I would have to live, somehow, in this galaxy with these other species, unless I wanted to start a war against the entire universe. They would see me as an aberration, no doubt, a freakish mechanical horror, and I would always look at them with suspicion, knowing they had tacitly supported the ones who killed humanity, that they had enabled our destruction, even if it had been just through their passivity. But wasn't that human too, giving them the benefit of the doubt, trying to find some common ground? I didn't know. Truth was, I wanted to hurt them. I wanted them to feel their share of pain. And yet so far I had no actual reason to justify that, other than my own suspicions. In the end, I guessed I had no choice. If I truly believed in justice above all, if I truly believed that my own cause was right, then I had to consider them innocent. Until proven guilty. An olive branch, then. Slowly I had my soldiers drop their weapons to the floor. It was symbolic, of course. A mere non-verbal message. If the alien decided to attack, I wouldn't really need the guns to put him down. The creature's eyes did a weird sort of blink, his surprise evident even to me. But he seemed to pick up on my intent, and hesitantly placed his own handgun down. I ordered my leftmost soldier to enter the cockpit and approach the fallen fox thing, its movements slow and deliberate, each motion telegraphed so as not to scare the aliens. The silvery one eyed the machine warily but didn't try to stop it. I had the robot offer a hand to the hurt creature, which looked surprised from the hand to the machine's faceplate and back to the hand. It asked something to its partner which seemed to reply in the affirmative. Then the creature grasped my hand. Strange to feel that sort of contact again, one that I had almost forgotten about, even if it was through the very limited tactile sensors of my assault robot's hands. I helped it stand up straight. The creature let out a groan, and the silvery alien started moving towards the gun. For an instant, it looked like this tentative truce we had managed to establish was going to come crashing down, but then the brown alien said something and its partner visibly relaxed. My robot started walking towards the cockpit's exit, half carrying the hobbling creature along the way. The other alien eyed the gun again in indecision, but then followed them, leaving it behind. I had my two soldiers take the group's rear. 
Getting the pair of aliens out of the crashed ship was a complex operation that took the longest part of an hour, and involved a chain of assault soldiers working in conjunction, along with the support of three of my flying drones. At points I was worried the hurt creature wouldn't make it, its fur covered in bright blood. I had a couple of robot squads go through the local area, looking for whatever passed as first aid supplies for the Zenvirians. When I finally got them out of the wreckage and into the open, the silvery alien looked shocked. He stared around at the devastated landscape in silence, then pushed my closest soldier in the chest while screaming some unknown word over and over again. My soldier didn't budge. I wanted to say something even though I wasn't sure of what, but I realized I hadn't designed my assault army with the capacity for speech in mind. I had never intended to negotiate with the Zunvir Republic after all, so the machines just stared at him in silence, frozen. Eventually, he shook his head in a very human-looking sign of defeat and walked up to his partner. I had a drone land next to them and drop the medical supplies I had managed to scavenge. This was as far as I could go. I wasn't a medic, didn't know anything about the alien's physiology or how to heal their wounds. Surprisingly, the silvery one looked as confused as I was, but the fox thing seemed more knowledgeable in first aid and started giving out instructions to its partner, who set out to work cleaning the wounds applying some sort of gels on them, and wrapping them in bandages. Two of my soldiers watched the procedure with interest, relaying the images to me so that I could file them in my memory databanks and go through them later. If I ever was put into the position to perform first aid on a fox-looking alien again. Meanwhile, I had my troops clear out and secure a corridor from the crashed ship all the way to the remains of the spaceport, killing the small group of Zunvirians that were trying to set an ambush out of a nearby building. I knew there was no point in saving the creatures just to abandon them to their own luck in this irradiated, ruined world. They wouldn't survive for long. Not in their condition. No. If this was my attempt at not fighting the other civilizations, at shooting for some sort of coexistence, it would make no sense unless the rescued creatures could escape, survive long enough to get back to their respective homes, and deliver that message for me. I had started working on that particular issue even before I had managed to extract them out of their downed craft. If they were to leave the planet, they would need a vehicle. I knew my own drones weren't up to the task, even though many had carrying compartments of their own where they could transport materials, salvaged artifacts, assault soldiers, or nuclear warheads when the occasion required it. They just didn't have any sort of life support system on board. I could always manufacture new types of drones, a new design able to transport living beings, and I might end up constructing a few of them in the future, just in case this situation presented itself again. But for the time being, I had figured out a faster way. Most, if not all, the Zunvirian ships parked at the spaceport had been damaged, yes. But they hadn't all been damaged in the same places, and the modules they were built from had originally been designed to be interchangeable. So I had set out to assemble my very own Zunvirian vessel, out of the surviving pieces from three other different ships. It wasn't as easy as it sounded, though. Even the surviving modules had damages of their own, with bent pipes and burnt surfaces all over them. I was using a relatively small patrol ship as the main chassis, since it had survived relatively intact and only needed some of its main components replaced. A fleet of drones was working on it, welding beams together, rebuilding its life support system, and attaching a new power plant and engine block that I had extracted from nearby freight transport crafts. Too much work for saving these two creatures, who hadn't done anything for me, who were probably friends with my enemy? Perhaps. But that olive branch I had wanted to offer? It had to be delivered. When the medical treatment was over, I set them to move. It took some gentle pushing for them to get the message, and one of my robots had to carry the hurt one bridal style. The silvery alien startled at first when that happened, but after a few words from his companion, he allowed it, even though he kept stealing glances at the carrying unit from time to time. The procession advanced slowly. It had to. While my assault troops had the infrared channel of their cameras and access to the detailed terrain scans my scanning flying drones had created with their radar sensors, the aliens relied entirely on their own eyes and were victims to the limited visibility. I also didn't want to risk the group falling into some unseen pit, so I had them follow a winding path that made wide detours around some of the most unstable areas in the ruined city. 
It took them almost three hours to reach the spaceport, and by the time the impromptu spaceship I had assembled was ready to fly, or so I hoped, there was always the risk it would just explode on ignition with these things. But I doubted it. When the creatures saw the contraption for the first time, they stood frozen, exchanging words in their own language. What? Did that mean they didn't like it? True, it wasn't my greatest design, but I was proud of what I had managed to build in such a short notice. The male turned to look at me, at one of the soldiers. He said something and waited, maybe expecting some kind of response. I had the machine point at them, the spaceship, and the sky, in quick succession. He said a word, and his head bobbed slightly. Was that a nod? Something else entirely? The robot repeated the sequence of hand signs. Them, ship, sky. Them, ship, sky. This time, the alien didn't say anything. He just helped the injured creature get into the ship. After a few minutes of waiting, the vehicle's engines started and the craft began moving. Well, it hadn't exploded, at least. I watched the vehicle from a safe distance with my drones. It didn't leave the planet straight away, as I had anticipated. Instead, it flew over the ruined city, making lazy circles around a particular set of ruins as if searching for something. Curious, I consulted the map I had made from orbit. It was the place where one of the city's largest buildings had stood. Some sort of administrative facility, I guessed. Were they looking for some artifact? Some critical weapon to use against me that they had kept in there? I didn't know. But whatever it was, I didn't think it would be a good move to let them have it. I thought I had been generous enough so far. I sent a couple of my drones and had them fly in formation. One to each side of their ship forcing them to stay on course if they didn't want to crash into one of them. The aliens seemed to get the message and abandoned their search, accelerating to leave the planet. For a fleeting moment, I considered shooting them down. It would be easy. Just have one of the drone's vector thrusters align 15 degrees off course. The drone would crash into the ship's engine section, probably disintegrating the craft right away from the impact. Or, if it survived somehow, then they both would die when their vehicle crashed into the ground a couple of minutes later. So easy. It would only require a thought. All this time I had been helping them. I had been working within the safety of knowing that my decision was reversible. That should I change my mind, I would have no problem killing them at any moment I chose. Up until this moment. This was the point of no return. If I let them leave now, I wouldn't have any way to retract that decision. I would be committing to it, to that vague and dangerous idea of coexistence. I didn't do anything. And watched with ten thousand eyes as their ship engaged its warp drive and slipped out of normal space, out of my reach. An olive branch. I wasn't a monster. Not yet. Maybe. On the planet below, the Zunvirians' empty eyes withheld their own judgment on that. With a mental shrug, I started the preparations for my next move. I recalled some of the machines, left others on the ground with updated orders, started spooling my own warp drive, my mind already considering how to approach the next battle, what reinforcements I needed to manufacture, which system I would attack next. All right, guys, that's going to do it for this one today. Thank you so much for being here. I really do appreciate you. Um, I hope you guys like the uh, new standard uh, opening that I'm going to probably put on this one. Um, all of the all of the videos are still going to have their Zren Presents and title credits and, every, er, and uh, you know, uh, kind of like opening scene, whatever. But in addition to that, there's just going to be a little thing that says like, comment, and subscribe. Uh, and then maybe also, or like, subscribe, and then also click the Patreon link in the thing down below. Um, but it's just like a short 20-second animation. I'll have it in the chapters so you can skip right by it if you don't want to, you know, mess with that. But thank you guys as always. I really do appreciate you being here. Um, who, who's, who's, who's everybody? Um, no, that's not a good one. Um, Oh, 
Do you guys know what the ship of Theseus is? I think that's it. Hold on. Let me let me look that up. Okay, yeah, the ship of Theseus. So, uh, in the metaphysics in the metaphysics of identity, the ship of Theseus is a thought experiment that raises the question of whether an object that has had all of its components replaced remains fundamentally the same object. So, imagine that you are basically taking a uh, a ship apart and one board needs to be replaced. You replace that board. Is the ship still the ship? A lot of people would say yes. You haven't changed its shipness. You've only changed the boredness of that board. Um, but what if the ship is heavily damaged and then half of it's replaced and then the other half is damaged and that half is replaced? Is it still the ship of Theseus? Or is it a completely different rebuilt ship? Ah, this one always messes with me. This, this, this one always fucks with me because like, it also it also kind of delves into the idea that every seven years, every cell in your body basically is replaced, so you're a different person. It's why you can develop allergies when you're 21. Um, but we are gestalt entities. We are not just one thing. We are made up of billions and trillions of living cells. So what the fuck are we? Are we a thing? Or are we many things? Uh, mm, brain... Okay. Anyway, guys, I love you. I'll talk to you later. Bye, y'all.